everyone. Welcome to another episode of Marketing Leaders. My guest today is Meech Jackson. You want to know about Meech because he has an incredible, incredible set of skills. My gosh, between Thank law, uh, everything related to tech, web, and law, and now, um, at least, but not less, um, mar digital marketing, content marketing, social media marketing, like like crazy. I've, I've, I've never seen that, honestly, and I'm living in the U.S. for the past 10 years now. So I'm <laughs> so thrilled to welcome you today, Mitch. Um, Thank you, Karine. I, I did a summary to the audience of the impressive things you've done mm -hmm. coming from a personal injury lawyer that I think you still are to all those things, great things you're doing in marketing. So just before we start, give us just a little bit of introduction and background about you. Very Ooh, well, well, first of all, I am even more so impressed by you and what you're doing. I love your work. I love your content marketing efforts, sharing with professionals how we can share a brand on the different platforms. So, uh, you know, you, you left out running and paddle boarding. Those are the two things I'm most proud of. But uh, in the legal and digital worlds, you know, I'm a trial lawyer, 35, 36 years of trying cases here in Southern California. I love bringing into the digital space many of the things that you and I have experienced in litigation and trial. Um, I think it's really important with Web3 AI and the metaverse technologies right now for professionals to wrap their arms around and embrace these technologies, bring them back to Web2, to traditional digital and social media marketing but also push the envelope to build new brands, to offer new services, and to create better client experiences. That's why I'm on shows like this with you. I, I just really think it's important that we have meaningful, open conversations, the good of everything we're going to be talking about, and the bad, the friction, <laughs> the challenges, the time we need to spend to learn this stuff. And so it's a pleasure to be here with you, with your audience, and uh, Everything's on the table. Whatever questions you have, I'll share my honest answers with you. That's we talked. We talked about before going live. I I shared with you my grandmother is from a little town outside of Paris, so I have a a particular awesome. you know you know uh, <laughs> relationship with with uh, with the people of France, and it's one of our place favorite places for my family to visit. We've been there five or six times over the last uh, fifteen years, so it's good to be there with with those amazing human beings. It's good to be here with you on Thank digital you. and let's do this. Thank you so much, so much. Thank you, Mitch. Um, so I'm gonna go straight to the point. You are a lawyer receiving tons of awards in, if you correct me if I'm wrong, in the per personal injury uh, field. You are an outstanding digital marketing consultant. You are a speaker, you're an advisor, you're a consultant. So the first question is, please tell me, when do you sleep? When do I sleep? <laughs> I sleep just fine all night long. So here's my How little many secret. Hours? Here's my little secret. My little secret <laughs> is for what you see on digital, right? For what mm -hmm. everyone sees me doing online, you know this as well as everyone else that's that's really been in this space for a while is I'm very particular with the content I create. I say no to opportunities more so than I say yes. And so when it comes to practicing law and taking on new cases, you know, I may take one out of every 20 cases that come to the law firm. That allows me to have the time to create digital content. It allows me to have the time to work with a team, to work with different products and services that help me not automate my, my, my social media, but really schedule it. So if I'm in trial, funny story, I'm sitting in trial, a two week trial, opposing counsel during the morning break leans over and he shows me his phone. And he goes, Mitch, how do you do this? We've been in trial for a week and a half. We're about halfway done. You've been tweeting all day long, every and single day during trial, right? <laughs> Didn't even realize that there are platforms out there that we can use where on a Saturday or Sunday, I'll sit down with my team. We'll schedule out 10 or 20 tweets that are relevant to today's trending and breaking news that are relevant to what I'm interested in. And they go out once or twice a day for the next couple of weeks. So I balance learning how to say no to potential clients or speaking opportunities or business opportunities with leveraging technology to do what you see me doing. And by doing all of that, it allows me to really prioritize my health, both physical and mental, to put mm -hmm. my family first. And then frankly, my practice and everything else you see is third on the list because without health, without family, in my opinion, nothing else matters. So I've got a good balance, I think, of 
how how to go about building your brand, expanding your practice. And I'm doing it in a way that's not stressful. I'm doing it in a way that anybody can do if they just give themselves a chance and, and give it a try. Well, I'll be honest with you. I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up, when we talk about jobs. Okay. I grew up on a ranch in Tucson, Arizona. First person in my family, you know, to go and graduate from college, certainly the first person to become a lawyer. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I started off practicing law by playing basketball all day long down at Main Beach in Laguna Beach, California. My first couple of clients were the guys that I ran the court with. And uh, I kind of figured it out on my own. And what I figured out quickly, though, is that in Orange County, California, which is very crowded, a lot of the top lawyers in the country, if not the world, are in Southern California. Uh, to stand out, you needed to be different, right? You couldn't just get good results. You had to do more than that to stand out. And so I realized back in the day that by sharing motocross racing pictures, pictures from the basketball courts, you know, pictures and, and videos back in the early days, it kind of connected me with a group of other lawyers and other business owners that could relate to how I was living my lifestyle. From that came business. Okay, this is really before um, the internet and social media as we know. And I'm talking about early magazines. I'm talking about uh, pulling out pictures from my wallet of bar association meetings. But when the internet came along back in 1995, we put up our first website. Um, you know, when social media rolled out in the early 2000s and middle of the 2000s, we started creating, you know, audio and video content. And what I noticed is everything that was working for me back before this technology was working 100x more for me with That's digital. Cool. Now, it was fun to do. Uh, when I'm not in the office or trying cases, I don't want to talk about the law. There are other things that I like to do in life. And I realized that by by sharing my brand, by sharing who I am on the different platforms in this fashion, it allowed me to connect with other people, people like you. You and I are both interested in content marketing. We're interested in adding value to our community through digital content. We would not have ever met had it not been for me testing the waters of digital, seeing what worked, continuing on a consistent basis to create this content and really just kind of embrace who I am, both the good and the bad. I've made a lot of mistakes, right? On, on digital sets, things I shouldn't have said, don't always think things through. And, and to answer your earlier question, that's probably why a lot of lawyers um, maybe hit the brakes a little bit before doing a live video or before doing a live interview on a podcast. And all I'd like to share with everyone is that none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes, right? We all we all will put a sentence together that's not grammatically correct, and it's okay. What I've learned is that by showing who you are, your human side, by being real, especially as a professional, that's what connects you with people. And once I was able to give myself permission to embrace that kind of mindset, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, from that point forward, everything else has just exploded. So I've never been just a personal injury lawyer. See, I, back in the day, and, and to this day, we handle catastrophic injury and wrongful death cases, but I also handle a lot of complicated business litigation cases. When social and digital rolled out, we purposefully pivoted the firm a little bit to help online entrepreneurs and business owners make the right kinds of decisions, legal decisions in these new digital spaces. Over the last couple of years with Web3, AI, and the metaverse, we're doing the same thing. We are consciously, intentionally pivoting and embracing these new technologies, adding our legal experience into the conversation to help creators and entrepreneurs make the right business and legal decisions moving forward. So it's an evolving process, which kind of keeps it fun. I don't know how many lawyers you've met or your audience has met who's been doing this for three decades. And I'm more excited to get out of bed in the morning and, and help a legal client than I've ever been in my life. Most of the lawyers I know after 10 or 15 years are burned out. So I think by kind of uh, uh, approaching the practice of law, and embracing these new technologies in the way that we're going to talk about, it keeps life interesting. It keeps the practice vibrant. It keeps your mind working because we're learning new things. We're learning new approaches. We're taking established old communication techniques that we use in arbitrations, mediations, and trials, storytelling, for example, 
and we're incorporating them into our everyday Web3 metaverse and AI content creation efforts. To me, it's a natural transition that I am just loving. And frankly, there's not enough time in the day because I just want to keep on going. I don't want to put my head down on the pillow and go to sleep, but you and I both know that's critically important. So. <laughs> When I started in content marketing, I actually started a startup saying that, okay, as of today, anyone can access any types of legal information he wants. So why would I, as a lawyer, try to charge those people to answer basic questions when I can give it for free? Yeah. Make them things on their own that if they want to find their answer to the questions, go be my guest, do it. And then at some point, they will notice that they need someone else than just basic information. But at least I will spend my time teaching them that they need a lawyer for something they don't even realize they do. So I created those encyclopedia of law for all. I was a, I had a PhD and I teach law at university. So for me, it was natural. And here is the point. Sorry for the long story behind the question. No, I love it. The, but the thing was, I realized that there was a major shift, be shift between a gap. I would say, lawyers and digital marketers. Digital marketers are, at the time, and we were back in 2009, were dying to get content and they understand the value, the economic value of content in their overall digital strategy. On the other side, lawyers, they create content every single day. They're great natural born speaker, like um, storytellers, Mm -hmm. can talk about like in two minutes or two hours in the same topic and write at the same way with no limitation. And I said, come on, there has to be a way to connect those two things. And I tend to think that the lawyers were the best content marketers ever, as long as they wanted to become one. So that's why I created this whole platform. My question to you, is, why are not, why is there so few lawyers who understand that they could kill at digital marketing if they wanted to do so. I don't know. I mean, it's crazy when you think about it. And I'm yeah. so glad to hear you say that because I think it's, it's a couple of different things. Uh, it's probably the training that we have as lawyers. Mm -hmm. We don't want to come across and make a mistake. We want to do our due diligence. We want to overanalyze things that don't need to be overanalyzed, right? This isn't a summary judgment motion. This isn't a complicated legal issue. I'm doing a casual interview with you. We're having a conversation. The outcome doesn't, I mean, in the scheme of life, I want the outcome to be great. I want people to really enjoy this content, but let's just say you're having a bad day. I'm having a bad day and, and, and the interview doesn't go well. You know what? The sun's going to come up tomorrow. It's good. That life goes on. I'm not worried about it. It's not like we're losing a case. But here's the thing. What I have noticed is when you have the right people creating content together, magic happens. And so I think the first thing is lawyers are afraid of looking bad, uh, of, of saying something, putting their foot in their mouth. And, and there's no need for that, right? Most lawyers on a bad day, on their worst day, are better, I think, when it comes to storytelling, when it comes to analyzing a trending news topic than, than most other people. And so you need to give yourself permission, right, to put yourself out there. The other thing is, I think some lawyers think they're losing business. If I answer all of these questions, if I put content out there, then why would someone want to hire me? And that's the complete wrong way of looking at creating sure. content, right? Yeah. What happens is, is if you if you add value, People start to know, like, and trust you. People start to look at you as the perceived go-to expert in that area. And on the simple things, sure, they can now, for example, go to chat GPT and get a great answer, generally speaking, to most of the basic legal questions. Frankly, even some of the more complicated legal questions, right? Um, Google, too. But what happens is most consumers don't want to do it themselves. Most consumers really want to have a, a working understanding of what the issue is, what the available options from a legal perspective are, and then they bring you in. Then the phone rings, then your email inbox lights up, then your DM on Twitter or your DM on Instagram or your private messages on LinkedIn. And I brought up all of those 
because that's how people are communicating nowadays. Exactly. They're not sending you a letter. They're not necessarily using the phone. They're not necessarily even using email. They're connecting on all the other platforms, whether it's TikTok, Discord, or the platforms I've mentioned. And they reach out to you to retain you, to help them take that legal issue you know, over the hump, to help them get sleep at night. So I think for all of those reasons, we're not seeing a lot of people embrace and leverage the power of this technology. And I think when we're looking at Web3, AI, and the metaverse, you know, meeting clients in a beautiful virtual conference room, which has been a big hit with our clients, by the way, right? right. Not a lot of lawyers are doing that. So not only does it create a new experience, but it's also great for branding. You've got your clients talking to other people around the world that, hey, I just met with my, my, my lawyer in, in their the conference room. And it was beautiful. It was a 10 out of 10. It's nicer than our three conferences room, conference rooms here at the law firm. And so I think for all of these reasons, they self-limit their opportunities. And I have a blog post coming out tomorrow, which talks about why it's really important for lawyers and other professionals to really embrace this technology, not only to create better client experiences, but also to build their brands. And I think the lawyers that do this and the professionals that do this and the business owners and entrepreneurs that do this are the ones that are positioning themselves for long-term success in business and branding. And those that don't will be um, over the next three to five years, there'll be an afterthought, generally speaking, not in all cases, but generally. And so I don't want to see that happen to any of my friends or any of my community members. So that's probably why you and I, uh, you know, feel sometimes like we can lead a lawyer or a professional to water, but we can't make that professional drink. And I'm done with, with trying to make other people drink. What I want to do is I want to embrace this technology, use it, and continue to add value to the community. So let me say, generally speaking, if I was a typical law firm or, or starting off a new company or a startup, right, whether I'm a lawyer, a doctor, a CPA, or just a business owner, I would allocate a substantial amount of my available revenue, my time and resources, my team members being properly trained to building the brand. Okay, mm -hmm. to making connections, to networking online. I think it's really, really important. When I look back on my career, what's allowed me to build a global brand and people around the world and have business opportunities and speaking to opportunities from all over the place is doing what I just described. In other words, allocating a great deal of my time to marketing and branding. Now, I'm not a big fan of the term marketing, especially when it applies to digital. We're talking about the same thing. It is marketing, but I look at it more as relationship building. Um, okay. SEO, right? That's Search good. engine optimization. A uh, long time ago, I coined the phrase social engineering optimization. It has more to do with social relationships in my in my view. And as a lawyer that's that's trying to walk that talk, it surprises a lot of people because most people are used to late night lawyer television ads. Right. And I don't like those. They don't they don't work on social media. They shouldn't work on social media. So I've kind of taken a different approach. So the short answer is, I think a substantial amount of your annual business building budget, and this includes bringing your team members in and teaching them how to interact and respond to questions and use a lot of this technology. I think the more you can spend to do that, the better off you're going to be three, five, 10, 20 years down the line. With respect to my firm, a little bit different. We're, we have our marketing and advertising budget is almost zero, believe it or not. Okay. And, and I just want to be honest with people. Uh, what we've done is we laid that foundation. We've allocated with team members uh, how to handle different aspects of what you see each day. And um, we're in a, a unique position where we're at the other end of the spectrum where we've got this, this global network and brand set up. Our channels are firing on all cylinders other, other than one that's kind of changed drastically over the six months. And I'm not going to go into names and, and, and social media platforms, but it has, but that is what it is. Um, and so what we're doing is we're, we're kind of like, what you see is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to me and I've got, you know, everything else floating underwater, just pushing it forward. I think it's really important to do though. And I think that moving forward, 
if you, you know, you could be the best, you could be the best lawyer in town, but if nobody knows who you are, then you're going to have a hard time paying the monthly bills. And so you got to do what you got to do to get your name out there, to get your brand out there, to toot your own horn in a way that's informative and helpful while building community at the same time. And I think if, if, you, if you're able to do that, spending a, $1 a month or $10,000 a month for a smaller firm, then I say do it. You got to do what you need to do to get the job done. Amazing answer. And another question based on this answer, how much, how would you ventilate the difference between working on the corporate brand of a law firm, which is often the case, the name of the partners together sure. or brand new name and the personal brand itself of the lawyer. Uh, and it's a very tricky question because sure. as of today, I think if I was the marketing manager of a law firm, I would spend a lot of time thinking, do I need to promote my corporate brand or my two law um, lawyers, stars lawyer in my firm and go fully onto a blog around them, a YouTube channel around them, a, blog, a podcast <laughs> with them. How would you do that? Well, first of all, I would I would do an inventory as to who in the firm um, might we want to highlight. Do they have the types of personalities that would complement a digital okay. brand? That's the first thing, because some people uh, they just don't. Who, they probably they just don't. Right. And so you probably shouldn't put them out as the face of the law firm. But I'll tell you. When I look at entrepreneurs, whether you like these people or you hate these people or you feel indifferent about these people, when I talk, you know, when I mention Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or uh, yeah, Virgin yeah. Atlantic's Richard Branson, right? Um, you know, just mentioning the names of these people bring out the emotion of the consumer. It mm -hmm. brings out your trust or distrust in the company. And I think it's critically important to blend the two. And that's what I'm getting at. For example, you can have a law firm who, who, where you're marketing their brand, their image. It's a corporate identity that people can relate to and trust. Large corporations, for example, if I, you know, at least here in the States or here in California, if I say in and out Burger, okay, people just start salivating over a good hamburger. It's a, it's a hamburger chain here in Southern California, and it's branching out across the country. In-N-Out Burger, I don't know who the owner of In-N-Out Burger is, but when someone says In-N-Out Burger, I think of palm trees, California, and a good burger, right? Especially if you like burgers. Uh, imagine if the owner of In-N-Out Burger was somebody that was active in the community, trying to make a difference, trying to help society be a better place, had a good outgoing personality or someone in the firm or the company had those qualities, put them on video, have them do a podcast, have them do interviews, have them do commercials. It's a combination of all the above. So it's not one size fits all. It's what works best for you. What are your digital assets and what are your human assets? How can you incorporate all of these together? Maybe using someone like you, Kareen, where it's like someone that knows what the, what the elements are to put them together, to blend them, to serve up that final dish or recipe that the consumer is going to enjoy. So it kind of depends on who you are, what you've got going for you, and what are your digital and human assets to make it all happen. Just in terms of budget, you said a major uh, part of the budget, but just to have an idea of the number, 20%, 30%, 50%, just- so so. So, you know, my son graduated from SC uh, last year and took a position at VaynerMedia in, L in LA. He's a post-creative strategist. And Gary and I have known each other for a long time. You know, however people feel about Gary and VaynerMedia, they either love him or they hate him. Uh, most people love him. The, mm -hmm. the, the deal is, if you look at how Gary's built his business over the years, okay, he went from one person on a YouTube channel on Wine Library talking about wine, but he blended in his personality. He blended in his business approach to having empathy and being positive and being a team player into his brand. So as he and his brother, AJ, started VaynerMedia, it went from two people to 1,800 people and is now you know a leading provider. The point is, it was all of the above. And what Gary will tell you is, you know, he's got a crew of what, 20 or 30 people basically that are creating content about him, about where he's traveling, about who he's meeting with, about who he's having 15 minute interviews with, and they're filming it from different angles. 
Uh, and it's because of this content that that he's been able to amplify his brand, which brings in clients, which builds the agency. Okay. So what I would suggest, if I was starting all over again, and you know, with the revenue that I had coming in my first five years of practicing law, which wasn't a lot, uh, because I started off on my own, and I just hustled and made it happen. But what I would do different is instead of maybe buying that home on year three or buying that nice car, you know, after the second year of practice or taking that expensive trip, I would have instead saved that money and hired a group of four or five people to do what we watched Gary do. Okay. Those four or five people are following me to depositions in the courthouse. They're, they're helping me uh, put together trending news stories. So when there's a breaking news story that everybody around the world's talking about that has a legal flavor to it, um, they're helping me create content on all the platforms. Now, remember, we didn't have all of this back in the mid to late 80s when I started practicing. So I don't feel like I missed out on anything. I had to do it the hard way, one at a time, right? But I think in today's world, you give me four or five people. Uh, so my budget would be probably, you know, my budget would probably be fifty to hundred thousand dollars a year for four to five quality content creators who are young, who are eager, who are hungry, that are willing to work and, and do this. Bring them into the law firm, into the dental practice, into the medical practice, into the CPA practice, and create content much like Gary's doing at Vayner. And I think you can really just expand your brand from local to global at an exponentially fast pace, unlike anyone else traditionally might do. That's what I would do different. And so even if I had to take out loans to do that, I would absolutely double down at getting as many people as I needed to create as much content as I can to distribute on all the different channels in a way that complement TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, YouTube shorts, Instagram <coughs> shorts, interviews like this. Um, and if I didn't have the money to do that, Kareen, what I would be doing is I would be reaching out and having a weekly show interviewing senior partners of other law firms that don't practice the type of law that I practice shining a light on them, interviewing them. How did they get started? What got them interested in the law? What's their favorite case that they've handled? I'd be building relationships with people like that across the country, basically with the idea of not only shining a light on really good people, but also building referral relationships. Mm -hmm. Because when they need to refer a client to a California firm, I'm going to be top of mind because of the relationship we built in both pre-show, during the show, and post-show production. So that's the inexpensive way of building these relationships and building that brand. But I would try to do a combination of two. And it's not how much money I would spend. It's what funds do I have available? Are there funds that I'm spending someplace else that I probably don't need to be spending? And can I allocate that back into building a content creation team or hiring someone, okay, to do this for me, someone who I trust, someone who understands my mindset that can basically do this for me. But I'm going to need a couple of people to shoot <laughs> content every single day, just like Gary, to, to create this momentum to take things to the to the next step. What do you think about that? Do you think that's something that might work? Do you think what are your suggestions on that? I'm just curious. So no. yeah, so it depends on what kind of, what, it depends on what kind of brand you want to build too, right? So here's the thing. Uh I I know and have friends that are lawyers that spend a lot of money on the radio and with television and billboard ads. Uh, that are at the top of the market, the top of their game, and they're doing very, very well. They're spending millions of dollars a month, a month, Kareem, okay. doing this kind That's of stuff. I wanted to bring that to you. And, and, and the key, though, is unless you're one of these big players, unless you've got that type of budget, it's hard to break in and get noticed in these already oversaturated uh, and dominated market spaces. Florida is a great example. California is a great example. Uh, having said that, for most people, right, for most people that don't have those types of advertising, uh, advertising budgets, and by the way, I don't think it's A or B. In other words, you don't, if, let's say you're successful with radio or television or billboard, or, or you enjoy that type of advertising, which I never have and, and never really did. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't preclude you from also dipping your toe and playing in the digital 
marketing and advertising sandboxes. You can do both, right? In fact, the best blend the both together. Those that are doing traditional marketing, there's a digital component. I mean, on the Super Bowl ads yesterday here in the United States, what I was looking for is how many of these ads are bringing people back to their website, their Instagram account, to some type of ongoing engagement to keep the relationship moving forward. And very few companies were doing this. And, and it was kind of disappointing to me. So I think that, uh, look, for, for most business owners, I think the best spend for your money is, is acquiring the time and attention of your potential customers, your clients, of the consumer, and of referral sources, those other lawyers, those other doctors, those other business owners that you mentioned, via great content that's helpful, that's created and shared and distributed and, and created very cost-effectively on the, on the social and digital platforms. That's what I'm trying to say is if you want to stand out in a sea of noise, you've got to do things different in today's world. And I know we're going to transition into Web3 AI and the metaverse, but I really feel like professionals and business owners that somehow link their products and services, link their brand to these new three areas of technology, these three areas of opportunity, I think it really does allow you to have your voice heard above all the noise. Being early on social and digital and live video for me was a game changer. It created opportunities from all over the world that other lawyers didn't have because I was early, I was first. People weren't used to live video back in the day. I was on a show was called Spreecast. It was before Blab. It was after YouTube and before Blab around 2011, 2012. Jeff Floor is the co-founder of Spreecast. He also was a co-founder of StubHub. He st sold StubHub, StubHub uh, in his mid-20s, made enough money to retire for the rest of his life, got a little bored and realized there's no live video in social media. This is when we had 3G. This is when there was no live video, everybody. That It, it was a new thing. And when they reached out to me, to be on a couple of shows, to be that lawyer on some of these shows, my friends are like, why would you want to put yourself out there on a new platform, a new concept? Um, really? What if you make a mistake? What if somebody, you know, tries to throw a fast one at, I said, I'm a trial lawyer. That's, this is my life. I'm not worried about it. I said, yes. And within a couple of weeks, I was on shows with Katie Couric, Anderson Cooper, Peter Diamandis, Seth Godin, Gary Vaynerchuk. We all just dived into these platforms. Um, and, it, and it just kind of blew up my brand. So you can't do that now on traditional digital space. You can market your practice, your business, your products and services. But if you want to build your brand and stand out, I think from what I've noticed is I'm experiencing in the Web3 AI and Metaverse sandboxes, I'm experiencing everything I experienced back in 2007 through 2012. I'm experiencing everything 10x from what it was back then. Like that's where I think people need to put their time, attention and energy and start spending some time each day learning a little bit about this technology, not about the coding, not about which company is developing the next you know, update to a platform, but how can you use AI right now to help you create better content in an ethical, effective, transparent way? Okay, I don't care which company is 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 behind the AI. I don't care which web browsers incorporating the AI first. I'm not going to spend my time writing and reading a bunch of blog posts about that. What I'd rather do is create content and use these tools to share that content, you know, on LinkedIn like you see me doing at the same time simulcastly si si offering a simulcast video broadcast of an interview in a spatial virtual reality venue that's just gorgeous and maybe at the same time turning around and grabbing an avatar ripping the transcript and having the avatar the ai avatar repeat the same message in a different format for something we'll we'll, we'll share next week that's the kind of stuff that really stands out people are talking about people reach out to me about they're not reaching out to me about my facebook post my twitter post my linkedin post or anything else it's this new technology and uh, I really forgot what the original question is, but I feel better that I was able to get all that off my chest screen because I, I do want people to kind of focus on the new technology if they really want, if they want to build their brand, right? Uh, otherwise, if you, you know, if you're comfortable with where you are 
and you're not willing to spend the time or attention uh, to build it, to build these new skill sets, I understand that too. Right. There are times where I've turned down really big cases because I wanted to spend more time out on the water paddle boarding. It just it just depends on what your personal preferences are. There's no right answer for any, you know, for all of us. We have to decide what do we want out of life? How do we want to do what we want to do? What are our goals? And then how can we put every take your take action on everything? First, it would be smart for lawyers to get to know how these things work, to use it for their own content and to use them also for their own process within the company. Because I think AI, I so all the repetitive tasks that we have at the lawyer is a game changer for the legal profession, not only for their marketing. So my, 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 my point on that, if a lawyer had to say, okay, I'm going to get, I'm convinced, I'm listening to Mitch Jackson, I'm convinced, I'm going to dig my my toe into the web three and metaverse and AI waters. Um, how do you recommend them to start for their low practice for their marketing? Do what I'm doing. Their, yeah. For their future customers and a new area of law they could take over in what, what, by so, what should they start? So I'm glad, I'm really glad Karine, you asked that question because that's when you see me creating content, that's what I'm creating it around. In other words, I want to bring my community into these spaces. Don't mm -hmm. recreate the wheel. And look, liability and legal issues are around in everything we do. Geez, if we we're worried about being sued, if we we're worried about uh, being exposed to liability, we wouldn't get in our car in the morning and drive down the street to Starbucks, right? Potentially yeah. getting in an automobile accident. We wouldn't start a business where in the United States, on an average, uh, your typical business owner is sued three times in his, her, or their uh, business lifetimes. I think it's a lot more than that with digital now. But the point I'm trying to make is what the same challenges I'm seeing right now with AI, Web3, and the metaverse, I saw with the internet when it first rolled out. I saw with social media and cloud-based services, Napster, okay, was deemed <laughs> to be illegal, but now everybody's using Spotify and Netflix. Same mm -hmm. type of concept, except there are licensing rights and, and, and IP is protected. So it's an interesting time to be alive. Here's what I would suggest. I gave a keynote in Toronto to uh, a large legal conference. We had 20 different countries represented. We had 30 states in the United States represented. And I talked about Web3 AI in the metaverse. And what I noticed in talking to people afterwards is they weren't familiar with a lot of the terms that we use every day. Mm -hmm. uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, aka DAOs, non-fungible tokens, NFTs. What are these things? Smart contracts. Is that like a paper contract that thinks for itself? I mean, the terminology is just different. And they were afraid to read, well, what some of the people were afraid to raise their hand and ask questions because they didn't want to come across like they were, uh, you know, uh, not informed of this new technology, but they wanted a place to start without exception. It was the most enthusiastic group I've spoken to in a long time when it comes to lawyers. So when I came back, I spoke with my son, who I've already referenced. I said, Garrett, let's put together a book, a handbook that really helps everybody get through these challenges. It, it talks about the technology. It quickly defines that technology so that anybody can understand what it is and have a meaningful conversation. Each chapter has a section. Describe non-fungible tokens to me like I'm a fourth grader. And then each chapter has steps that you can take to learn more about it. And that's what this final yeah. product was. Okay, it's a blockchain. Yeah. And the other yeah. thing Garrett and I did is we used uh, chat GPT to help us uh, plan, organize, design, and write parts of this book, okay? Sometimes when you're writing, and one of the things I like about ChatGPT is I know what I want to say, but I'm not sure how to start the paragraph. I'm not sure exactly what I want to say. And it really allowed us to, to expedite this handbook and get it down. And, you know, we openly indicated where it says co-authors, uh, we affectionately named our chat AI, Hi, AI, the AI. Hi, the AI and Kai's mentioned at the back and also did the uh, introduction to the book. The point is, I wanted to be able to have something I could hand a partner in a law firm or a doctor and say, listen, you know, if you're curious about, let me just show you the index here. 
you know, what we did is we took the most important, often used terms. Right. Yeah. And so if you want to know more about, uh, uh, there's three chapters of AI, chapters 16, 17, and 18. What are our favorite commands? What are our favorite resources? It's right here. A partner in a law firm can spend 15 minutes on any particular topic and sit down with with uh, his fellow you know, managing partners and have an intelligent conversation. So that's what this was all about. What I may or may not have told you about, once again, with the help of AI, is we put together, and I don't know if this reads correctly in your on your yeah. screen. And but I'm it says, talk about, there's gonna be the well, link in my newsletter about it, it's for sure. Yeah, and all I was going to say is what we did is uh, we looked at the McKinsey report from the latter part of 2022, which identified 14, key scientific technology uh, areas that businesses and uh, industry should pay attention to. And so what I did is I took each of those 14 areas and then uh, part of my research included using different AI services to put together a full and complete chapter. This is the issue. This is why it's important. These are things lawyers can do to get up to speed on this topic and and move forward and so i think what people need to do is spend some time getting familiar with the terminology number one number two uh dive into something that you're interested in and by the way when i say interested in and i look at the chapters here i want to give everybody an idea because half of this stuff i wasn't thinking about until i read the mckinsey report you know, sustainable consumption, cloud and edge computing, trust architectures and digital identity, space technologies, quantum technologies, Web3, the metaverse, uh, applied AI. These are all industries that have a very, very large need for legal assistance, whether it's with contract law, IP law, whether it's <laughs> negotiating, you know, uh, different different jurisdictional issues, because these are oftentimes global companies. And so I think if I was a lawyer starting off today, I would be diving in and, and learning as much as I can about everything we've already talked about. I'd be focusing on three or four of these trends and I would be building my law firm around these trends moving forward. It's going, it's already changing the world, just like the printing press, you know, democratize the creation and distribution of books, just like the automobile replaced the horse and buggy, just like the internet has opened up our worlds and created, you know, a, a closer community with people from, you know, the plains of Africa to uh, the beach in Southern California, anybody that's got one of these in their hands, you know, has instant access to, to more information than, uh, you know, the president of the United States 40 years ago in a second. And then when you add AI into that, it democratizes doing, it democratizes information. So I think whatever we decide to do moving forward, I think it's really important to incorporate these technologies to to um, spend less time learning and more time doing so that you can add value. Once again, I don't need to know how this stuff works. When I walk into my office, I don't, all I want to know is when I hit the light switch that the lights come on. I don't really care other than from an environmental standpoint, because it, it does matter to me, but the way the electricity is generated, shared to our building, wired and, and, and up and put into our building None of that matters to me is if I just want the lights to come on. And I think with AI and Web3 and the metaverse, the same approach mindset can be used. I don't need to know everything about how this stuff works. I need to embrace it and use it as a tool, an intelligent tool to add more value to my clients. That's what I'm doing. Now, I am interested in the ethics, the intellectual property issues, right, with the data sets that we're using. I get all of that. But mm -hmm. people are working on that. It's not my job to spend yeah, to go down those rabbit true. holes and research all that. I don't have the time. Mm -hmm. Do I research IP violations on some of these class actions, which I'm not a lawyer in, or do I spend two hours paddling around the island in Dana Point? I'm going to take paddling every single time. So that's kind of where my mind's at on this stuff.
if I give you $15,000 budget in six months to start from zero and launch a practice and get the first customers, how would you spend it? You pretty much answered it. And it was mm -hmm. amazing creating content ever, as much as you can. That was brilliant. So I'm not going to ask twice unless if you want to add something. Well, uh, let me add something because this okay. is this is the part that I think a lot of people forget about is when I have young lawyers come in and watch me give an opening, a closing argument, for example, and I, this happens down in our courthouses. Um, afterwards, they'll ask me, well, Mr. Jackson, how did you know how to focus on that issue? Why were you standing where you were standing? Why were you focusing on that one juror, right? And they're looking for that magic pill, that app that they can download to learn how to do all this stuff. And I tell them, it's just from doing this for, you know, years after years after years, from making mistakes, from constant and never ending improvement, from putting in the time. That's, that's how I knew which buttons to push this morning with this jury on this case. And the $15,000 investment question, all I would say is, I absolutely would allocate a majority of those funds to building my brand like we discussed. Having said that, if I was brand new starting over, I'd also be up at four in the morning. So from four to eight or four to nine, I would be spending as much time as I needed to, to learn the technology, to learn the things that we've talked about. When all of my friends are wrapping up the day at five o'clock and, and, and they're having enjoying cocktail hour at the local watering hole, I probably uh, would join them for one drink and then come home and spend the next four or five hours doubling down on everything that has to do with my practice. And I would do that for one or two straight years. I would just absolutely out hustle every other new lawyer in town that was also starting off his, her, or their practice during the same period of time. Frankly, every partner in town on every established law firm, I'd combine that hustle with that $15,000 to build a dynasty. That's my answer. Well, I lived through the internet browser wars. I lived through the 90s and watched major tech companies come and go as one tech company would buy the other tech company and absorb it into their product uh, inventory, right? And we could worry about what you just said all night long, and none of us are going to have the answer until a judge makes a decision, until the government makes some kind of decision, or a jury comes back with a decision. What you just described, though, is what I'm saying from a consumer standpoint and a user standpoint, I'm really putting that aside. For example, I have chat GPT loaded in a tab. If I want to use it, it's there. I have Google loaded with the chat GTP Chrome extension added so that if I'm in a Google search, I can use chat GPT to actually drill down even more right now in today's world on a Google search. I've signed up for the Bing update, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is not only search results, but also chat GPT results. So for me, whatever final decision is made, if there is one, I'm okay with it. Like, in other words, it's not the, I, I don't have a dog in the fight. What I want is to be able to have the ability to use technology to better serve my clients. I'm going to let everybody else fight over that. And now if I was a lawyer representing one of these companies, it yes, would, <laughs> it would be a complete, well, it would be a completely different uh mindset and approach. And, and I haven't given it that much thought, but look, we're in a time right now where this, as much as the internet changed business in the world, I see these three technologies, Web3, Metaverse, and AI, changing everything we know 10x. And because of that, there's a lot of money involved. There's a lot of politics involved. We have even talked about digital currency. We're going to need digital currency to do commerce in these different sites. And so... I don't know how everything's going to wash out, you know, as far as where we're going to land on all these issues. I do know that it's going to be an interesting ride for the next 10 to 20 years. Oh, well, yeah. And, and uh, I do know that AI will be a part of that. In other words, right now, you could type that question into chat GPT with an appropriate prompt crafted the right way and probably get a pretty good idea on what the tendencies are 
with state and federal governments on antitrust issues involving this type of technology, you could probably get a pretty good idea of where we're going as to how IP law is going to progress when it comes to trademarks and copyrights, when it comes to transformation versus fair use issues. It's going to help expedite answers and solutions or outcomes to all the above. And the lawyers will obviously be a big part of that. And I'm curious to see what happens. Having said that, the blog post that I have dropping tomorrow, Kareen, would have taken me three to four hours or my team three to four hours to craft. Okay. Yeah. It's a good one. It's a good one. It took 30 minutes. Oh, 15 minutes. My goodness. 15 minutes, right? And so we're oh, going to let it sit and marinate. We'll look at it in the morning, like anything else, and clean it up a little bit. And it's out the door. Uh, I don't know which AI service my team members use to create it. I don't know which AI art generative service they use to create the artwork, but it's pretty cool. All I know is we leveraged AI, whoever's AI it was, to put in this final product. I will review it for final approval to make sure I'm comfortable with, with the content and the message You know, before I sign off on it. Mm -hmm. But that's where my focus is. And that's why I don't want people to get hung up on, you know, knowing all the nuances when in fact, it doesn't really matter to do the things that you and I have talked about today. That's phenomenal. I think we could spend hours talking about we this. Could. Maybe they're going to be a round two. You know what? <laughs> I, I hope so. That. Well, let's do a round two. <laughs> but when you're in California and we'll yeah. do it out on the paddle boards out on the water. How's that sound? Goodness. So this is breaking news. I haven't shared this link with anybody. So mm -hmm. my tradition, you know, people can connect with me over on my blog, mitchjackson.com. That's where I share a lot of this content. I'm also doubling down on LinkedIn right now because I'm not real happy with somebody who's running another platform. So I'm redirecting my energy over on LinkedIn. And, uh, but we just rolled out a new link tree that uh, accommodates the direction our firm is taking in 2023 and beyond, which have to do with these new uh, technologies. And it's linktree forward slash, that's link, L-A-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Jackson Wilson. So if you go to Jackson Wilson, one word on linktree, it'll go to really something that we're doubling down on moving forward as far as services in these new industries. And I'm really excited about it. That's amazing. I'm going to share all this very, very soon. Thank you so cool. much. It was fantastic to have you. You're the best. It was I've my pleasure. Like that. Really. Thank you, Kareen. Thank amazing, you. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Bye-bye.